All right. Good morning, everybody. Come on in. Have a seat. Now that everybody is is looking at me, we're going to try that one more time. Good morning, everybody. That's a beautiful sound. It's great to have everybody in one room under the name of Jesus, ready to worship him as Lord. Before we begin our worship service, we wanted to give you a few announcements. One of them is on the screen. Uh, this week, we've had some updates to our Wi-Fi network, and, and I know many of you have gotten some text. Hey, what's the Wi-Fi password? So if you want to know what the Wi-Fi password is, it's right there, okay? So that is the guest Wi-Fi. If you're using your Bible app or need it for anything, I found, I don't know who picked that password. I found it very, very humorous. Feel free to use our Wi-Fi. I just remember the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> <Okay>. <laughs> we have a really, really exciting week. Really exciting week here at FBC Sparta. And I know we're looking at some impending uh, troubling weather, but listen to what's happening this week. This Wednesday night, we're kicking off Awana. Can I get an amen? Yeah. It's been a long time coming. We've got an amazing team of people that have been working hard to get back to Awana in person. And so we want you to bring your students to Awana. If you have uh, elementary school students, Awana four years up to fifth grade, bring them to the fellowship hall at six o'clock. You can register them there. They will give you all the instructions you need. You drop them off there. They'll tell you where to pick them up, all that stuff. And your kids will learn great and glorious things about the gospel. If you've been, if you've been a part of our Awana program in the past and your, your child has a book, bring your book, bring all your materials that you can find. If you don't have a book, show up anywhere. And if you are a parent of an Awana-aged kid, we have a place for you to plug in and serve. We can, it takes a lot of people to run this ministry well. So if you're not currently serving anywhere or you feel like this might be for me, stick around, observe what goes on, and we have a place for you to plug in and serve. Amen? If you have uh, older students, we have uh, our youth group meets at the same time, 6 to 7.30, and we meet in the student room. We would love to have all of the youth in there. We have an amazing time, and you have an amazing leader. Um, that was supposed to be funny. Uh, uh, also, and if you're an adult, we have a worship service for you in this room, a refuel worship service. We would love to have you stick around. So this Wednesday is going to be amazing. There's a lot of other things in the bulletin, summer camp and youth camp signups. They've extended that deadline, but go ahead. So we'll talk about more about deadline and parent meeting, but go ahead and register your kids if, if that's something you're interested in. And, uh, and then today, I don't, I feel weird saying this, but today is the drop and dash uh, baby shower for my wife. Uh, many of you know and have asked, uh, our baby is due, uh, Marcus Henry Weldon is due on, on the 24th. Uh, but this week my wife had a fall, she's okay, but, but since that fall on Tuesday, she's been having lots of contractions, just not feeling well, and her whole body hurts, and she's uncomfortable because she's this big and the baby's this big. You guys get all that. Uh, but just continue to, to, to pray for my wife, and, uh, and, and we were just, just so excited to, to continue to share our family with all y'all. Okay, I know that's a lot of announcements. You guys okay? You feel like you sat through a boring sermon? Uh, no, okay. All right. Let's pray, and, uh, and then we'll make one announcement together as we worship. Father, we thank you so much for your glorious grace. I'm reminded this morning in, in my study with you, Lord, that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Lord, you bless us, but I pray that before you that our heart attitude would be right, that it would be humble, that it would be meek, that it would be merciful, that we would come ready to worship you, and that as we do, that we will see you for who you are, that we'll pour out our praise on you, that we'll say, God, where I am out of line with your word, would you change me? We come together as your people, and we are needy and poor and broken, but we know that you are amazing and glorious and loving. So we come into this place together to worship you and ask that you would transform us from the inside out so that we may go and make disciples of all nations. What we do here this morning is right, and it's pure, and it's good, but only if you get all the glory and praise, so we pray that you would. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Can, can we make this announcement together on the count of three? One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. That's why we are here. Let's worship him with all we have. Church, let's stand together as we begin to worship. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore. Yeah. 
praise him with our hands this morning. He is worthy of all that we are and more. Amen. You can be seated for just a moment. On this uh, Valentine's Day, men, be warned. If you didn't remember, now you've been reminded. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 is an appropriate place for us to read together, starting in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the father has sent his son as the world's savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the, Lord, or for the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and his sister.
you, Jesus. I have no loved us. We are humbled that you would make a way for people like us. We know what is under the surface. We know what we are capable of, and you do too. But yet, in your mercy and in your grace, you've reached out and you've saved, you've done a work. And so, Lord, we pray you continue that work among us today. Lord, for those under the sound of my voice who don't know you, we pray that you would let them see you as the treasure that you are and that they would come to know you in a personal way today. And for those of us who know you, that we would be refreshed in your presence and encouraged and changed by your word as we gather around your table, as we uh, get into your word together. We love you and we give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Just use this. Okay. Good. Good morning. morning. At this time, we're going to dismiss our children to Children's Church. I want to thank Mrs. Sandra Crouch for the amazing job that she does in her team. Let's show our appreciation. Let's give it up for the children as they make their way out. 
And a reminder to parents that they will be coming back in at the end of the service to be with us during the Lord's Supper. And we want to remind you that it is a teaching time for you to tell uh, your children what this is about. And uh, if you're a visitor, uh, feel free to walk back. We have, uh, you can talk with our, our team, our staff, about what Children's Church is about. And uh, so they can give you some information and you can take part of that. The rest of us, let's turn to Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 24. If you were here two weeks ago, you'll remember that we finished the first part of our sermon, this passage, and today we're going to look at the latter portion. As we continue on the book of Acts, we, uh, we're reminded that the, the, the main point, the thrust of Luke's words are this. He's compelled and absolutely baffled at the power of the unhindered gospel, that nothing can stop the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ, that all who believe in him and his death, burial, and resurrection are saved. And it is powerful, it is living, it is active, and it, it penetrates every area of life, every person, every tribe and tongue and nation. And that is what Luke is demonstrating. And Paul this one who has been saved by the power of the gospel is taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we're on his, finishing up his second missionary journey and about to start up his third in this passage. And he visits and revisits, as we learned last time, some of the churches that have come up in some places where the gospel has had an impact. And his whole point is to strengthen the disciples. And last time we talked about the aim of the church, the mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations. If we're not doing that, what are we doing? And this is to bring all believers to spiritual maturity in a place where they themselves reproduce to others as they take the gospel. And the second, we're going to focus on reaching the lost. Beginning in verse 24, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Luke writes, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Father, God, you are so good. And we're reminded by this passage that your goodness is most clearly seen in the fact that you redeem, that you save sinners like us. Father, those who are far off have been brought near because of the blood of your Son. And Father, we praise you that you use the unschooled and ordinary, simple people, normal people. You use a husband and wife tent makers to make disciples and to reach the lost. And Lord, may we be reminded that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that uses Aquila and Priscilla is the same power that we have because of Jesus. So God, open up our eyes and may we delight in your wonderful word this morning. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. And all God's people said, amen. One morning, 
And she turned to her husband and said, Honey, I just had a dream that you bought me a new gold necklace. What do you think it means? And the man whose name was Dave Fresh, I believe, I didn't mean to use your name. We'll just say Dave. He answered, I don't know, but Valentine's Day is coming soon. Then you'll know. And a few nights later, she again woke up after having a dream. And she said, this time I dreamed that you gave me a pearl necklace. What do you think that means? He said, you know, you'll know when Valentine's Day gets here. In the morning of Valentine's Day, she again, she woke up telling him about her dream. And this time I dreamed, she dreamed that he bought her a diamond necklace. And she asked him with passion, with excitement, what do you think this means? He said, honey, be patient. You'll know tonight. And that evening, the husband came home with a package and he gave it to his wife. And delighted, she opened it up and she found inside a book titled, the meaning of dreams. <laughs> Sorry, Mary Ellen. Sometimes we miss the point, don't we? Why well, it's so clear, we can miss the point. There's so much that's contained in these passages. I don't want us to miss the point. And there's so much in the scriptures and so much that uh, the Word of God tells us about discipleship, that to, to, to take immature believers, to establish, to equip them, and to, to, to send them out is, is a glorious thing. I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that at some point, the point of discipleship is to reach the lost. Is my mic working now? The point is to bring people by the saving faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. Yes. It's to tell people that if they believe, no matter who you are, no matter the color of your skin or how much money you have or what you've done or how far you feel from the Lord, that God's redeeming hand in his arm is not too short. That he saves the power of the gospel that we are to declare to the ends of the earth that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. The good news of Jesus Christ is good news and we have to reach the lost. Can I tell you as pastor of First Baptist Church, I'm not going to just leave this sermon in the abstract in general. Can I tell you what keeps me up at night? Let me tell you. And if you're watching online, if you're a visitor, this is an amazing church. No other place I'd rather be. I'm not going to be announcing my resignation today. And hopefully they're not going to be firing me. <laughs> Here's what keeps me up. We have an $800,000 budget. Multi-million dollar facilities and property. We have three full-time pastors and multiple full-time staff. We have, I, I lost track of how many deacons and amazing Sunday school Bible teachers and discipleship groups and so many programs and exciting things going on. What keeps me up at night is, are we reaching the lost? All that, if we are not at some point on some level, the rubber meeting the road and taking the gospel to reach the lost and seeing souls saved, what are we doing, church? We're missing it. Shut it down. Because at some point, if gospel interaction, if sharing the gospel is not happening, if we are not reaching the lost, then we are nothing more than a social club. And I'm here to tell you, I've seen our numbers, and we should be reaching so many more. And I'm talking to this guy more than anybody. It's like I know what some are saying, and you've heard me preach 
year in and year out for five and a half years, you know that I fully believe in the sovereignty of God, that no one comes to Christ apart from God's saving, solving, sovereign redemption. God must be the one who acts upon our sinful cold hearts. But here's what I know, is that if we are faithful in sharing the good news, if we share the gospel that is living and active and powerful, and if we, in a, in a place like this, where people's hearts are prepared for the gospel, and we pray, God tends to save people. We are in a prepared place. This is a place where people are prepared. The, the, the harvest is plentiful. The white harvest And if we can't reach more than a handful, we need to examine ourselves and we need to be faithful or we need to shut it down and you need to fire me. So as we look to the scripture today, that's a heavy opening, but I'm here to tell you that the good news and the exciting thing is that if we understand rightly the gospel, it flows from us. It is as natural as anything else. That we tell about what we love, that we declare the supremacy of Christ because he has demonstrated in our own lives his saving nature. Maybe the reason we don't tell others about Jesus is because we're not amazed by his grace. Maybe the reason we're not inviting others to our church is because they hear us talk badly about our church. And why would they come to a place that they hear you talk badly about? And why would they believe in a Savior that makes you so miserable or me so miserable? We must, we must, we must understand that the first, the beginning, the central portion of discipleship is sharing the gospel of evangelizing the lost. Now a man, a Jew named Apollos, look with me in verse 24. A native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. So we know by, by, by this, by scripture, that Apollos was, was a man who was learned. He was, he was a Jew. He grew up in Alexandria. Alexandria, uh, up until about 100 AD, was one of the most prestigious cities in the Roman world. And it was uh, in Egypt at the, the mouth of the Nile. It was uh, where the, the, one of the great wonders of the world, uh, the library, many of the scholars and mathematicians were. Alexandria was a happening place, a happening place intellectually. Right? And, and it is also a place where there was a, a, a large amount of Jews there. And, and the Jews were, were strong. And, and while he, he did not grow up in Jerusalem, he grew up understanding the Old Testament and the Torah he, inside and out. Uh, we have every reason to, to believe that. His name was uh, Apollos, which means destroyer. Right? That's a pretty cool name. Why did we not name one of our boys Just Apollos, Alicia? Apollos, a native of Alexander, he came to Ephesus. And so uh, it, it says that he was an eloquent man. And this word in the Greek, it means that he, this, this word, it could either be he was eloquent in speech or he was very learned, that he understood. It was in comprehension. Either way, uh, we know that he was very powerful. He was competent in the scriptures. He was prepared for the gospel. But verse 25 tells us he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Now, if you know the Old Testament, you'll know that this is a very common phrase, that he grew up in the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord, it says this about Abram. That, that he was to be saved and to point his family into the way of the Lord. To point your, uh, you know, Deuteronomy 6, uh, the way of the Lord, over and over again. Uh, that this was uh, an understanding of an Old Testament devotion to Yahweh. And so, some scholars disagree on this, but most think that he was, uh, this was a time between the times, and he had not fully grasped an understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
He certainly believed the, the Old Testament. He believed in a Messiah to come. He, like John the Baptist, believed in repentance and faith in God. He believed in the Messiah, but he had not come to full realization that we are sinners and that Jesus Christ died in our place. He rose again victoriously in that faith in him and, and making him Lord of our lives. It, 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 that is what saves us. He had not been saved in a New Testament sense. And so, he, but he was instructing people in the old way, pointing people to look for the Messiah. And it says, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. And though he knew only the baptism of John, this is the preparatory baptism looking toward Jesus. He had not fully understood the gospel. It says that he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Don't you love Aquila and Priscilla? I, I wish I had so much more time to, to unfold them. These are the partners of the Apostle Paul. These are the ones that Paul stayed with, he labored with. As we looked at last time here in, in Ephesus, they were fellow tent makers and they were disciple makers. Amen? Right, these were lay people that were getting it done. They believed that they too were called to the mission field and the ministry, and they were using their life, their homes, their, their, their money. They were aiming it all up on the table, and they were using it for the glory of God. And it says that they heard him teach. They heard him teach, and they heard him instruct about the Old Testament of pointing to the Messiah, but not fully understanding the gospel. So they took him aside. There's a, a deference here, a, a, a compassionate way. They weren't rebuking him publicly, but they brought him alongside. They took him in and they taught him in a way more accurately. In other words, the fullness of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, and that its meaning, the substitutionary atonement. And it says, and when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. So he believes in Jesus. Apollos is saved. And God uses all of the preparatory learning, all the, the, uh, the fullness, his eloquence of speech, and he uses it for his glory. Now he's saved. He's redeemed. And so, so as he, as he, do, he does this, I, w I want us to, to look and take note of Priscilla and Quilla, that they are in the synagogue. Why? Why are they there? They, they've been strengthening the disciples. They've been making disciples. They've been helping establish and strengthen, along with Paul, believers. Why were they in the synagogue? They were there to bring to fullness their understanding of who Jesus was, that Jesus is the Christ, that faith in him alone saves. They were evangelizing. You see, as we hear the buzzword of discipleship, I hope that young believers come to our mind, people that are, 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 are new Christians that need to be, grow up in their salvation. I hope that is the case. But we can never lose sight of the fact that it begins with evangelism, that we must see that discipling them and bringing them to spiritual maturity is to send them out to go share the gospel with unbelievers. And as Aquila and Priscilla and the Apostle Paul made disciples, they themselves were continually trying to reach the lost. And brothers and sisters, so should we. And it says that they, they, they told about as he went to, he's going to go to Corinth, they told about him. They encouraged the brothers to accept him. Why? Because he'd fully believed. This is a legitimate, real deal brother. You accept him. And it says, and when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. So he's strengthening believers. He's making disciples. Don't you love it? 
So Aquila and Priscilla, who had been reached, they've been brought to spiritual maturity. They go out and they're making disciples, but they're reaching the lost and they're, they're, they're building and pouring the end to people like Apollos, raising him up. And it, and it says that he is going and making disciples. But, but catch this. It says in verse 28, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. What's he doing? He's reaching the lost. He's doing the same thing in the things that you have heard in, uh, with me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will teach others. If we are making disciples, brothers and sisters, there must be our, uh, those that we lead and bring to spiritual maturity. They must see in our lives. They must hear from our lips proclamation of the gospel. Aquila and Priscilla are doing what they saw Paul do. And Apollos is doing what he saw Aquila and Priscilla doing. And he is sharing the gospel. People are being saved. The gospel is unhindered. It's undefeated. It is powerful. God will save if we are faithful to proclaim it. We must. I want you to, to think about this. This is not to bring condemnation. Listen, I'm talking to me. When was the last time that you told someone about Jesus? I mean that. In your mind, don't, don't say that, but in your mind, think about it. When is the last time that someone who does not know Jesus, if they died today, would spend eternity separated from God in hell? When is the last time that you shared the life-saving truth about believing in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection? Why? If the answer is not yesterday, why? If the answer is not last week, why? If it's not in the last month, brothers and sisters, why? There, 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 there must be an account to this. If we are followers of Jesus, which is what Christians mean, if we are little Christs, and Christ was about seeking and saving the lost, then are we really following Christ if we're not sharing the good news. And you say, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, it just comes out. What you and I are passionate about, it comes out. It's about telling people that you, a beggar, have found food and you have been saved and you're pointing other people to where salvation is. It is natural. One of the most amazing things that happens in the life of a church is when there's new life, when people came to Christ. I remember, Kevin, when, when, when Sandy Jackson came to Christ at Carlisle Avenue Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, and she was 45 at the time, had a, a student in student ministry, and I'm here to tell you she was on fire. She was telling everybody that she knew at work, in her family, she was telling them about the amazing news about Jesus. I remember when David Cuprion, who was a tatted up dude with this long beard, rode, rode, rode a motorcycle. He was a tough exterior dude, but he's really a cream puff, honestly, when you got to know him. But I remember he was so fired up about Jesus. The, the day, the first Sunday after he came to Christ, we walked through the gospel for weeks after weeks after weeks. And when he finally came to Christ, you know what the first thing he did? He brought... Ten dozen Krispy Kreme donuts to church because he was so excited. But everybody that he knew, he told about Jesus. I know some of us have been saved for a long time. But maybe our prayer is that God would restore to us the, and renew in us the joy of our salvation. As we strengthen disciples, as we're strengthened, we must understand that when we are healthy, when we are right, when we're amazed by the good news of Jesus Christ, it comes out. Now, I'm a nerd. I can't fix cars. I can put windshield wiper fluid in them. That's about it. I was an English major, and all I can do is 
Right. My wife is not in here. But I wrote a little poem for, to her. I, w- I was kicked out of my office the other day and wrote a little poem. Do you mind if I read it to you? Be like, please, no. Gosh, no. <laughs> With love from her dearest dumb poet. No tongue, no pen, nor melody do justice to the cause. To express my love so eloquently to the one whose gaze do I pause. The world behind, below, beyond, at her presence, disappearance, demand. My radiant beloved's tender touch makes me numb to both satin and sand. To hear my name in the thousands of throng from the sopranic voice of my bride. My ears go deaf to thundering scores. All other sounds go hide. The fragrance of the fairest flower, while pleasing does it smell. It commands no passing thought of mine when in her aroma I dwell. The savory sweetness of her tender kiss. Whoa. My boys are hiding under the pews right now. (laughs) My mind can never erase. All other delicious, delightful flavors when compared aren't pleasing to taste. My affection, my love, my passion and decree are not untested, unweathered, and new. I've beheld her beauty in all seasons. I've witnessed it again in every hue. I've heard her voice in anguish. I've heard it in perfect pitch. I've heard years of a repeated I do through sickness and not being rich. The smell of suffering and sacrifice does sear my mind's eye from our journey. The salty taste of our broken tears while hard, have been sweeter than honey. I know what unfading pretty looks like. I know because I've seen it in her. With age, with years, with kids, with tears, the Lord shining through her does occur. Off with naive, sentimental young love, it's proper and right in its place. Our seasoned love story are chapters of hope of God's relentless, unmerited grace. So here's to my darling, my sweetheart, my love. Tis all my stammering tongue can afford. With love from her dearest dumb poet, in summation, I love her more. Some of our visitors are saying, that guy's a wimp. <laughs> I share that with you. Not because I, I want you to be amazed at a a simple poem that I wrote to my wife because I want you to understand that that flows out of me because I love her because she loves me because I'm amazed that she has stood with me in, in, in sickness and in health and poorer and poorer and God has been so gracious to us And it just comes out. I wonder if our hearts are mesmerized, if we're captivated by the gospel. I wonder if it wouldn't come out. I wonder if it wouldn't come out more. I wonder if the people around us wouldn't sense it and see it and be convinced by it. Because I'm here to tell you, if it's not, if it's, if it's not coming from us, if we don't have a compulsion to share the gospel, we must ask ourselves, why not? We're sick or we're dead. Because out of a growing, mature, or multiplying Christian, we should be faithful in reaching the lost. And that's our plea. And that's our prayer. May God do that in First Baptist Church and He do that in our individual lives. Let's go to the Lord and ask Him to do that this morning. Father, God, I think about the amazing opportunity I had yesterday to share with a man in El Tapatio. the opportunity that I passed on because I was tired. God, I think about all the times in my cowardice or my inconvenience, I pass up souls around me. 
Father, I pray that I would be compelled by the love of Christ. I pray that you would awaken in us, in this church, a passion for the gospel, of telling others, to reaching the lost. Lord, may it be in everything that we do. I pray, Father, that we would not be able to sleep and to rest until we turn over every rock in White County to declare the good news of Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word. It is life and truth. And I pray that you would encourage us, that we would see that as we repent, as we are mesmerized by your forgiveness, that we would go and share that same forgiveness with others. And I pray that we would see that as we commit to you, you will give us a blessed life. You will open up opportunities and you will save. So do it, Lord. Help us to be faithful. God, if there's anyone here today that says, I, I don't share the good news is because I've never experienced it. May they give themselves fully to you. May they make Christ Lord of their life. May you save them. It's in Christ's glorious name that we pray. Amen. Church, we're going to stand and we're going to have a, a time of response. If you need to make a decision, if you need to follow Christ in, in any way, this is a time for you to do that. We're going to have a couple of our pastors down front. You come forward. If you want to join this church, if you want to give your life to Jesus, if you want to follow him in a lordship decision, you do that. This is a time that we respond to his word. We're going to sing out. And if you desire to, to follow him in any way, you come. I once was lost in darkest night. Yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and light had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to
Church, please be seated. And I'm going to invite our deacons to come forward. Gentlemen, if you'll just have a seat just really quick. As we transition into our time of celebrating the Lord's Supper, I just want to remind us of a couple of things. As we think about the ministry of Paul in Corinth, and we're going to get into it more uh, next week, uh, we're reminded of, of many things. The Corinthian church was messed up, right? They had many faults and struggles. One of the main things was division. In the book, they were fighting from the, the first chapter of the first letter to Corinthians to the end. They were fighting over all kinds of things. They were fighting in their marriages. They were suing one another. They were fighting over sin in the church. They were fighting over who they were followers of. In fact, Apollos became such a faithful believer that in the first chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul says some are, are, are boasting the fact that they're followers of Apollos, and some Cephas, as he said, but it's Peter, some Paul, uh, uh, you know, others Christ. Are we not all followers of Jesus Christ? They're following over order of worship. And as you get to the, the sad reality in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's hammering it out that they are showing lack of love. One thing that he uh, hammers out is the Lord's Supper. We have to understand the context of the Lord's Supper. It is a fellowship meal. It's one of the ordinances God has given us. Jesus gives us the illustration as a picture of the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we are all who are believers in him are recipients of. And as they get to the, the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's saying, are you kidding me? And why is he saying that? They're fighting over this. And the reason is because there had become a fellowship meal that they would celebrate as opposed to these, these parties that the pagans would have in worship of the false gods. And at these parties they would have in wealthy people's homes, all these people would be separated into a caste system. The, the most prominent people or the wealthiest people or the freed people would be in certain areas and they would receive the best of the food and, and all of these things. And essentially what Paul is saying is you're acting just like them. And that you're saying at this meal that we are all one in the blood and the body of Jesus, but yet you're denying it with your lives because you all are fighting over everything. In the scriptures, in the Jewish tradition and the New Testament tradition, one of the beautiful things as we set up for the Lord's Supper is that when there is reconciliation, when there is sin that has been forgiven, there is a celebrate, celebratory meal. Have you noticed that? Think about the story of the prodigal son. What happens when the prodigal son comes? His father runs and throws himself on his neck, and then he brings him to the home front, and he says, slaughter the calf. Let's have a party for him, right? A celebratory meal. What happens when Jesus is resurrected, and he sees Peter, his beloved disciple, who had denied him three times in the passion of Jesus? What happens? Jesus cooks up some fish. That's not just a random happenstance this is to demonstrate that there has been pardon that there's celebration that there's reconciliation when we get to the New Testament God gives us this as a symbol that there's been pardon if you're a believer in Jesus Christ we hedge this meal in that, that the only requirement as we come to this is that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and right standing with God. That you have, you're dealing now with your sin. It uh, doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it means that you don't have unconfessed brokenness, broken sin in your life that you haven't dealt with and you're not trusting in Jesus with. That you come to the table. It's a demonstration that we are needy of Jesus and his blood. Paul says it this. As our deacons stand, 
But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you came together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must not be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you must be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. In other words, if there's just all these divisions and fighting, you can call it whatever you want to, but this isn't a celebration of our union in Christ. For in eating each goes ahead of his own. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and then he had given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. Church, if you look in front of you, in these different times, we have these uh, prepackaged things. You'll see in front of you, if you're a follower of Jesus and you would like to take communion with us, we invite you to do that now. If you will just reach out and you'll grab one of these <clears throat> and just, just hold it for a second. In just a moment, our, our deacons are going to come. And for those that do not have these, if you're in the back row here, we are going to to, to fill the, the, the worship center, and we're going to pass out to those that did not receive them. Don't have it in front of you. And in just a moment, I'll give you instructions on how we're going we're gonna to partake of this together. First, the bread. This is a demonstration of the broken body of Christ, that he took our place under the wrath of God. Men. If you do not have one in front of you, if you need one, if you just slip up your hand, if you'd like to partake of the Lord's Supper, and as these men pass by, they'll get you one.
Okay, if you see this, uh, you just peel back this top layer and get this wafer. I need somebody to come help me. Church, this is a reminder of the bread of life. Jesus, if we come to him, we shall hunger no more. It's a reminder of the cost of our sin, that Jesus paid it all for us. So as we take this, as we do this as one, we're reminded that, that, that of our desperate need of Jesus and that in him we have it. We have forgiveness of sins. Let's take this in remembrance of him. Father, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for the manna that is from above that we cry out, what is this? How great a salvation that in Jesus our wounds are healed by his stripes. His death is in place of our death. Thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, church, if you'll tear off the, the rest of the covering. I have a cup of juice. The scriptures tell us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission or forgiveness of sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I need reminders that my sins are forgiven, that they're washed as white as snow. As far as the east is from the west, so has God forgiven us in Jesus Christ because of the blood of his perfect son. As we take of this, may we be reminded of the sweetness of a relationship with him. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Father, I thank you for the blood. I thank you for Christ. I thank you that in him, rascals like us can be forgiven, redeemed. God, that you can make us your ambassadors. Thank you for the good news. And I pray that we would be reminded that we are united in him, that we are one in him, that, that you would bring us to that level of unity that our Walking it out matches our message. May you make that part of a reality here at First Baptist. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Church, we pray that you have a blessed day. If you're a visitor, thank you so much for being here. We have a welcome desk, uh, the, the welcome center that's out these double doors. If you walk through that hall um, right there, there, there's what we have. We would love to say hello to you. We'd love to know that you are here. Uh, please stop by. You can also fill out a connect card. That will serve us greatly. We're honored that you're here with us. We'd love to share what God is doing here. So let's church, let's stand. And, and as we stand, I want to make you aware, uh, just on your way out, there is the, the drop and dash. Um, and, and so I, I'm asked to communicate uh, that there are, is a table. This is for baby Marcus for the Weldons. We just want to show them that we love them. And, um, and obviously we want to keep uh, Debbie and them safe. Uh, and so uh, you can drop something off. There's cards there. There's envelopes there. If you want, if you weren't prepared, but you, but you can fill out a little card and you want to put that in envelope and, put, and attach it to the tree, I'm told that you can do that. Um, we just want to show them that we love them and encourage them. And so um, take that opportunity uh, to do that. Any, anything else? What's that? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, there, there'll be some men. If you did not get a chance to, uh, to, to, to give online or you want to drop that off, there'll be some men collecting with baskets on your way out. You can do that. And so, church, let's pray. Let's close in prayer. And we ask, uh, we just pray that you have a, a wonderful Lord's Day and celebrate Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you for good news. Thank you for reminder of your love for us. God, I pray that in our lips we would uh, declare how great our God is and how great the salvation in Jesus Christ and how wonderful forgiveness of sin is. So God, may we, in our freeness, in our forgiveness, may we go and we declare from the rooftop that Jesus is Lord. May you do it in us, Lord. We ask in Christ's glorious name. And all God's people said, amen.